the view of the fan tail. Oh, now I see it. Okay. Ooh. Oh my gosh, it's already 6.30 in the morning. Yeah. Whoa. The first 30 minutes of this watch, like, drug by, and then... Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm like, oh my gosh, we only have an hour and a half left. Yep, only that much. Okay. <laughs> you said that with a little bit of sadness. Only, only an hour and a half. I think by seven, I'm going to start to get hungry, so I'm, I'm okay. If we're going to be hanging out here for a minute, um, can we do uh, tight work up on the associates on the Paragorgia? Oh, yeah, you'll get the black round, yep. <laughs> Online viewer wants to have Dan go play the claw machine for him. Claw machine would be kids' game because you have stereo vision there. You don't have to use multiple cameras for different angles. <laughs> <laughs> Think about the plushy collection Dan has at home. <laughs> every Christmas, every birthday, every holiday, people just get plushies from Dan. Yeah. Kids must be One, super excited. Two, three, <laughs> it's another plushie. Got. So we got four brittle stars. And a whole bunch of zoanthids on a pink morph port paragorgia. Whoa. I want to paint my house in these three colors. The bright orange, the hot pink, that kind of mustardy toned down yellow. Sherwin-Williams, if you were listening, I will be your customer if you can match these. Just take them a picture and they can match any paint color, can't they? Yeah, I mean, that's their promise. Really? Yeah. Wow. Oh. Nobody's really moving. Oh, there's that brittle star moving a little bit. I don't see... Uh, Steve, if you're listening, what, when, what depths do you see amphipods and mice and shrimp and stuff most commonly. I'm really surprised at the lack of small swimming associates I've seen so far on this expedition. Brian, do you, did you know Jacques Cousteau? What? I got a question about a professor being friends with Jacques Cousteau, and they mention your name. Yes. Um, I know who the professor we're talking about is. Yeah, Art Science is happy with the shot. Thank you. Yeah, I had a professor in undergrad who um, was friends with Jacques Cousteau. All right, myth proven, yes. Yeah, Dr. Phil Dustin at the College of Charleston. We t had a couple classes with him. He had one of the best, um, one of the best final exam questions I've ever seen on a test. And he had a, a circle driven drawn on the um, on the paper, and said, "This is planet X Y Z. I forget what." it spins opposite to Earth. Now draw all the biomes on Earth, or draw all the biome distribution on this planet based on the fact that it, it spins uh, west to east instead of east to west. I thought, How do you answer something like that? Just draw all the biomes except in reverse? N well, more or less, yeah, but the spin of the Earth controls Coriolis effect, yeah. and so all the different ramifications of Coriolis being opposite 
how would you move? So the exact opposite of all the biomes. In some ways, it'd be a mirror image, yeah. But you know, you'd have western boundary currents would become eastern boundary currents, and so you'd have hot, you'd have warm water flowing up the eastern side of um, the gyres, and you'd have cold, broad currents coming down the western side, which is reversed from Earth, and your um, trade winds would blow opposites and everything. Did you get a picture of the close-up there? Sorry, Dan, who are you talking to? Corley, whoever's working at DSC back there. Oh, uh, yes, sorry. It's all right. looking at Grafana. Ooh, these are awesome. Thank you. There's a big Aridogorgia off there and to the right. Every time I see one of these things, I'm just shocked at how uniquely beautiful they are. Are there similar species like this all over the world? Like this little curly Q pattern? I'm certainly used to seeing them all over the Pacific. Um, so pretty. You don't see any of the little coralless jellyfish that we've been interested in, which are common on these. Have you been able to sample any of those? I know you got some the first night, but they didn't survive. They didn't survey, and we haven't seen any since. Thanks. I think I got a couple shots. So what do you do with the still shots, Corley? Um, I'm going to be honest. I don't actually know what happens to the still shots afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I mean, we ha we can screen cap the Hurricane Argus. Uh, that's generally what Chris would be doing. Um, but the still cam, I think it just has much higher resolution. So for more beauty shots, um, we can use this. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons why normally, or not normally, I think normally this is runs on, it takes a picture every 30 seconds, which I always thought was crazy because the amount of 
data you would need to store these really high resolution well, pictures compared is a to the lot. Compared to the video at Pale, it's nothing in terms of data storage. True, but um, yeah, I think one time they accidentally had it set to like two seconds though, and it really like freaked someone out. Gotcha. This used to be a bamboo coral. What is that sack? Some kind of urchin, ah, uh, urchin, excuse me, an anemone. There's a retracted anemone. So here are your non-solitary hydroids. All that little white fuzz or yellow fuzz there. So question online is, what is your favorite mythological or legendary creature? I don't know what mine would be. I've even had like a couple of minutes to think about it. Looks like two different Chrysogorgids here. We've got a Metallogorgia on the bottom left and a Chrysogorgia. Uh, here on this other rock, and then that looks like maybe our first urchin of the dive, maybe, or at least of our watch, up on the rock towards the top of the frame. I'm still struggling with the mythological creature. Yeah, yeah I really am. Like, I'm just sitting over here kind of racking my brains, and I'm like, all of these are kind of sad creatures for the most part. I mean, it'd be really cliche to just say Kraken. Right, right. But... I was thinking of a German one that I knew growing up, which was Der Wassermann. And it was, but it's a water monster that lures children to their deaths. So I'm like, I don't think I'd want to be that. Can we zoom cup coral, please? Is it one that we want to be, or is it just, just our favorite. favorite? Yeah. I do like the ones that lure children away. <laughs> <laughs> um, There's too for many some of those reason, in the world. For some reason, when you said mythological, I originally, I just like went to like, oh, it was like Odysseus, you know? Oh, yeah, I was thinking about Greek. <laughs> Greek mythology is kind of where my brain went to. Apollo, the sun god. Ooh, I have one. Okay. Um, dear lady. So Deer Lady is like a, a Native American siren, and mm. it's a beautiful woman who's part deer, so she can run really fast, uh, be very evasive. And so what she does is she finds men that have hurt women, uh, men that have not been good to women, and then like lures them in and then kills them. Okay, so Deer Lady's my favorite. Uh, we're, give me a second. There's another paranoid swimming. What do you think the odds of being able to collect that without a slurp is? Then don't worry, then, then we won't. If we do <laughs> Uh, it's okay. It's it was kind of a borderline, um, and if and without the slurp, it probably isn't worth it. All right, let's go.
a useful ballast sized sample. So growing up, I was never a big fan of like the claw games or like when you would go out to like, we had Gaddy Land and you would like play all your, at ski ball and put all your quarters down. Never liked any of those games. Ski ball? Yeah, like they're fun, but I was like, mm, nah, I want to go waste my money somewhere else. Like even as a little kid, I never could enjoy the arcade games because I was like, I had to work for my money. This but you wasn't weren't, given to me. But you weren't wasting your money because you would use your tickets that you won and you would go buy candy afterwards. <laughs> Chris, would you make a note on the um, sample sheet? He spent $20 on him. We're doing the sampling. <laughs> to play games and win a Tootsie Roll. <laughs> that was about right. <laughs> and you were so excited when you got that little plastic, like, harmonica thing. Yeah. Like, oh. A kazoo. A kazoo, yes. I never liked going to those places because I was always just like, again, even as a kid, I was like, this is a, I had to earn my money. I got up early to work concession stands on Saturdays. You know, I really want to go back to, but I need a kid to go back to it. I want to go check out Chuck E. Cheese. not been there since a kid i want to check it out find out if my nightmares are still are still real in chuck e cheese with the animatronics chuck e cheese rebranded they did it yeah it doesn't look the same anymore that's why I, like i've heard about it and i heard that they actually have decent food now i heard that they yeah it's like actually like a good date night spot for adults like two whoa so maybe don't take a kid there or maybe I like take them and just let them go <laughs> so you don't have to pay for a babysitter. Because <laughs> I was going to say, I know like we have a Chuck E. Cheese in Corpus and it gets so crowded on Saturdays. So I'm like, I want to go check it out. I want to go see what's what's in there. I like Dave and Busters in my, in my age. Or actually in Providence where I live, they have a, um, it's called Free Play, but it's like an arcade bar. You have to pay a cover to get in, but all of the games are free. Ooh. And they have like really old video games. So they have this one where you're like like a little German person pouring <laughs> beer for people and it's super hard. <laughs> <laughs> so Corley, what kind of, what lava flow formation creates this plane this? that we're seeing here? Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't look like anything to me. Normally with like, it's kind of hard to tell here because there could be something underlying, but maybe over time there's just sediment accumulation. This looks like pretty abysmal to me. I obviously know we're on the side of a seamount. It's easier to tell when there's more, um, there's like more slope. So you think it just might be like sheet flow underneath it that then these pebbles have kind of laid on top of possibly yeah because we collected a few of these pebble looking things over the last two dives and looking at them in the lab they're they pretty much look like basalt pebbles yeah they're definitely not nodules we yeah the, i remember a handful of them were just way too heavy another one of these little chrysogorgias we've been seeing yeah we spent a lot of time slamming them with hammers last night trying to break them open and <laughs> they are definitely mainly basalt. Did you use rock saw? No, we did not use the rock saw. We don't touch that. It scares us. That's, <laughs> that's Adam's domain. I, I really but, like the rock saw. I haven't been doing it as much because I want everyone else to get a chance to use the rock saw. But I think using the rock saw is pretty cool because getting to break open the rock, it's like breaking open the earth. Makes me feel strong. We got a couple of the ones that have the really clear, or some of the clearest, like having a nice tan color or gray, light gray with the super black crust on top of it. And some of the clearest, like this is what crust, this is rock that I've ever seen mm -hmm. on a couple of the samples we've cut so far this trip. I 
I really enjoyed using the rock saw. It was a ton of fun. Make, I have to admit, it makes me nervous on a pitching ship watching y'all play with that big saw on deck. It makes me nervous too, except Adam is like, don't worry, you can't cut your finger even if you, you try. You literally can't cut your finger um, because the blade is uh, it's a diamond edge blade. Mm -hmm. So diamond, uh, surprise, surprise, or maybe not surprise to anyone, is the hardest mineral on earth. Um, so on the Mohs hardness scale, it's 10. So the the rock saw, it the blade doesn't have any sharpness to it, like a knife at home, like a kitchen knife or something. It only has hardness to it, which is the diamond edge blade. And that's what's cutting the rock open. Um, so you can't cut your finger. You could, actually, you could cut your fingernail because your fingernail has hardness to it. I think it's like about a hardness of around two or something, um, or like 2.5. But yeah, you can't actually cut yourself with the blade, which is pretty cool. I still don't want to test it out, though. <laughs> yeah. the, the multiple thousand RPM spinning blade still produces enough friction to do plenty of damage. Well, it's I not understand bad. it's not sharp. People don't need to be scared of it. Viewers at home, don't be scared. <laughs> don't be scared of the giant saw. <laughs> Go play with it in your own backyard. <laughs> Give it to your children. This is not an endorsement by any means. No. <laughs> Back at MGSL, when we give tours to little children, it's really fun to be like, look, I'm like touching the saw and I'm spinning it with my hand and nothing's happening. And everyone's like, what's going on? <laughs> what kind of witchcraft is this? So for people watching at home, we do anticipate getting into an area where there might be more life and more um, at least interesting rock formations to look at here. We're crossing, we've been broadly climbing this kind of small knoll, mound, hill, whatever you want to call it, off the flank of this uh, geo. And we're in a big flat section right now from, and we should be getting into the steepest slopes we've seen on this dive uh, in the not too distant future. Um, as we cross this plane of very little life and very little relief. And then it should get pretty steep after that. Not very, not super steep, like I don't expect anything vertical that's very tall, but we should get back into at least rock jumbles. I am ready to see some biological diversity. I'll even take some more crinoids, especially if they're headless crinoids. The corals really get all the love down here and, and the sponges to some extent get a little bit less interesting and then the crinoids and the anemones for a lot of the point kind of get ignored, which is um, I think a shortcoming in deep sea science right now. We need to spend more time looking at the communities as a whole across all the fauna and not just focusing on the corals and sponges. But the taxonomy for some of the other groups has not worked out as well. Um, and so it's a little bit harder to work on them from a, an ecological point of view. Not that the taxonomy for the sponges or corals is all that well worked out either, but it's in a better shape. I'm still thinking about that stalked hydrozoan from the other night, or hydrozoid, hydrozoan? Solitary hydroid. hydroid. Solitary hydroid. That was probably my favorite thing of the entire expedition so far. So if that was a solitary hydroid, there must be non-solitary hydroids? Yep. Is that what they're called, or are they called communal hydroids? They're just called hydroids. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, we've seen we've seen a bunch of hydroids. The little fur that you see on dead coral skeletons is usually hydroids. Oh. And that was just a massive one that we saw. Yeah, like multiple orders of magnitude bigger than its cousins. 
I wonder if we'll be able to see another one on this expedition. I, I wouldn't be so. surprised. They're not too, too rare. And a lot of times they're smaller, so we've probably, you know, seen one or two and not really known it in kind of that generic small stuff that's around corals. What's really interesting sometimes when we bring up the rocks is we find little tiny on the verge of microscopic organisms on the rocks that look just like their like full adult um, relatives. Like you find a little tiny sponge that's maybe one and a half millimeters tall but looks exactly like an adult sponge sitting on the rock or like a two millimeter tall crinoid, uh, stalked crinoid growing off one of the rocks. It's pretty interesting sometimes to take a microscope, uh, like a magnifying glass to some of the geology samples and find the little baby recruits uh, growing on it. Crinoids have this very strange triangular shaped head when you first, when they're that small. I remember spending most of one night on uh, on the Okinawa Explorer trying to find out what I was looking at. Um, and it turned out to be a, a very, very small baby stalked crinoid. Um, but it had a very unique look to it when it was so little. So I think we're going to look for a rock sample here and see if one of these things is loose. Well, we'll still we'll bring them up and and use it as a sample. So we'll record it as a sample when you do it. So for those at home wanting a video camera of the rock saw. I think there's a TikTok or an Instagram post of us using the rock saw. Because I know I took a lot of video for it. But sometimes it just takes a couple of days for it to come out. Yes, please. We'll just count. We can. Um, we'll take. If you're going to pick up two, we'll just kick, make it two samples. Yeah. Well, if you can spin it and get us a good shot of that one before you put it on there. You want to sample and sit you shot this one, please. Yeah. You got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're good. Thanks. That's two different samples. Yeah. We counted as two different samples. So Corley, why were we now able to see these bigger rocks down here? Like instead of, so we've just been seeing those kind of pebbly ones. And then all of a sudden we just came up and it was pebbly rocks with some big rocks on top. Yeah, I'm going to be honest, I don't know why. But whatever rock was underneath, it was probably bigger. I don't know, it maybe like these rocks fell from the higher up on the Gio. Right, yeah. Roger. Yeah, yep.
So why are we taking three rocks instead of just, like normally we just take one, cruise along, find something interesting, take a sample. Why are we doing three? Nope, never mind. Pretty shot in Atlanta's view of Hercules moving across the uh, the seafloor, the kind of dynamic lighting across the two vehicles. So question for Brian or Corley, when we take uh, soil samples, what kind of stuff do you find in them, either the biological or the geological samples? Both. Well, <laughs> what kind of stuff? There's some quartz in there, but I think it's mostly bio. I don't know, I honestly haven't been paying attention to the sand. So we have not We have not been doing much of a workup on it on board, um, but We've got some collaborators uh, in Mexico who are interested in the Miofauna. Um, so that's all the creatures that live in between the sand grains, basically. And there's a whole host of biodiversity. It's generally deep sea sediments are more biodiverse than like deep sea corals. You find all kinds of different phylums all existing in the same thing. You've got four or five different flavors of worms and mollusks and all kinds of creatures live um, in, uh, in the sediments here. And it's something we frankly don't pay enough attention to with the ROV work because you can't really see it with the ROVs. But most of the original studies in deep sea biodiversity was looking at um, the miofauna uh, and the stuff that live in the sediment using box cores and piston cores and things like that where they would drop these sampling devices from the deck of the ship down and just grab um, a, a section of deep sea sediment and then painstakingly detailed sort and classify all these little organisms that you need a microscope to really understand what they are. Um, so kind of the when we think about large scales of patterns of biodiversity in the deep sea, a lot of our knowledge is based uh, on work done in the 50s, 60s, 70s um, before really we had anything other than Alvin to go down here and look at um, the life down here is but so we know it from these deep sea sediments um, so there's a huge amount of life in there uh, a shockingly amount every time I look do look at it I'm amazed at how many stuff lives in it and by stuff are you meaning like the bacterial colonies no the worms? big with the worms and stuff worms little arthropods little um, bivalves all kinds of things and under, under, you know, if you take the time to do pretty lighting under a microscope, they're beautiful. You can really, the gorgeous um, examples of micro, uh, small life. Not microbial, but kind of that mid-zone where you're not small to be a microbe, but you still need a microscopic kind of, you need to still need a, I'm not being articulate at all. You need a microscope to study them, but it's like they're still multicellular life. 
and look like crabs and worms, just like we would see if they were bigger um, without the magnification. Well, the fact that we're getting back into small boulders here um, is, uh, I think I'm optimistic we're going to be at least getting into more interesting terrain here shortly. The vehicle navigation and our multi-beam sonar maps are also kind of agreeing that we should be approaching the steeper terrain, and lo and behold, here's a coral. Good-sized bamboo coral here. And after hundreds of meters of seeing nothing bigger than a few centimeters, here is a meter-tall coral. And I have no idea why this spot right here can support this coral and all the other spots don't, or why it, you know a single coral recruit found this spot. It's one of those things that kind of drives me nuts about deep sea ecology. And by drive me nuts, I mean drive me nuts in a really good way. I find it scientifically fascinating. So one of my labs that I do with my students is we take a plankton net down to the beach and right where the waves are walking or crashing in, we'll walk around with the plankton net and you catch so much sand. And then in that sand, you can see all the foraminiferas, the radiolarians, just like you were saying, but it's not the meofauna, it's just nothing but protist, all the little microscopic stuff. And it's so interesting because you're right, once you play around with your light settings. And when I put it on my big microscope um, and I can project it onto the big old Promethean board, oh, it's awesome. So much diversity, so many weird looking things. Just at the tail end of this year, we started doing the same thing with different soil samples from our wetlands. Just kind of playing around with it, see, what's, see what we can find. I'm looking forward to pun intended, digging, digging into it more next year. Another Umbalula uh -huh. here. We don't need to look at it. That one's easy to ID. What was it? It was an Umbalula. Oh, I thought, I thought there was something else to it. Is an umbalula a type of sea pen? Yep. Okay. And this looks like another Bathopathy's black coral here. Mm -hmm. oh. Find the rocks and immediately start finding the corals. I did a Google search on um, black coral and then black coral jewelry. Because I was like, I don't know what this, you know, I want to see pictures of it. And now on my uh, Google search or like every time, you know, you go to an, uh, a website, an advertisement for black coral jewelry comes up. And I'm like, I don't know if I like this. <laughs> is it is it ethically sourced? <laughs> I love Google AdSense totally. Yeah, exactly. So 
So there probably, any, oh, sorry, go ahead. Probably be seeing that for the next two weeks. Yeah, exactly. Like when I bought an air filter and for the next month there's nothing but air filter ads popping up. So is there any chance of us seeing a Chana Cops down here? Sure. Absolutely. It might be a little on the deep side, but Another nice bamboo coral. Ooh, shout out to Giovanna from Brazil. Good luck on your protozoan test. Hope you do amazing at it. Can we look at the base? So bamboo corals um, are generally roughly divided into clades right now as the taxonomy is still being worked out. So I'm trying to figure <coughs> out what clade this um, bamboo is. And right now I'm leaning towards S1, but I'm not sure of that. And I'm I'm good whenever you are. Um. So when you're doing sediment samples, how come the sediment um, tube is left open at the bottom? Wouldn't it be easy to like have a little snap at the bottom to close it? The catch on that is is. If there's huh. anything internal to the tube would mess up this. The, so if you're doing um, push cores for a lot of times, you're really particular about the layering and you don't want to disturb the layering at any cost. So if you have some kind of like closing mechanism hiding inside the tube, it would mess up the layering. And if you had a, some kind of closing mechanism outside the tube, it wouldn't push cleanly into the sediment. So you and there's a one-way valve at the top and you basically cl you know hope the suction holds until you get it in and there's stoppers in the bottom of the um, push core holder that you um, that'll hold it closed in theory um, until you get to the surface in practice it's quite difficult actually mm. great answer thank you We have not had a lot of success this expedition of maintaining um, the striation. The, the, yeah, we've been getting s mostly getting the sediment, but it comes out very jumbled. Another Chrysogorgia here. Save little little bushy one we've been seeing this whole dive that I believe they sampled on the last watch.
Is this? Nice holothurian here, or sea cucumber. Hello, friend. That one looks like an in-between of the, the deep purples that we see and then the completely clear ones that we see. So during one of the interactions yesterday, I got a question, have you ever been scared on the Nautilus? And my answer was like, no, I've never been scared. Everybody's really safe. And I talked about the safety drills and everything like that. Um, and I was just thinking, I have something that actually scared me last night. I was reading uh, something on Reddit and it was like, scariest movies ever. And I was taking this really deep dive into horror movies and like reading back and forth on Reddit. And I was sitting in my bunk, like lights all out. And Samantha, my roommate, snuck in and was like, I'm sorry. And like, it, <laughs> it scared the bejeebus out of me. I like jumped and I screamed a little bit. <laughs> so now, when I get that question in the interaction, has anything ever scared you on board? I can say, my roommate, late at night, sneaking up on me. Um... I saw this video, actually I've seen a couple of videos mm, on great. how orcas uh, will have been somehow trained to, they'll like work in groups and work to capsize like fishing vessels yes, and like where big yachts. Is it, yachts is it off the coast stuff? of Mallorca? Like yeah, it's I off an island, yeah, I've been hearing about that. Like, I'm kind of like, you know what, you know, do your thing, orcas, but I'm like sitting here on a boat, like they can't tell the difference between like a fishing boat and a research vessel. Yes. So I'm just kind of like, uh. So I believe this is a slime star of some type. What? That's such a thing? I have never heard of a slime star. It sounds like a make-believe creature. Does it make a lot of mucus? That's my understanding. Slime star. So if I pushed on it because it looks so like cute and pushable, like a Pillsbury Doughboy, <laughs> would it like would it be like woohoo and squirt out slime? I don't know actually. Can we try? It? Yeah. <laughs> no, we don't need we don't need to harass the organisms. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for being the adult on this ship. <laughs> are they okay? So are slime stars common in the deep sea? Are they everywhere? I've just never heard of this organism. I have no idea anything about it, other than it's a kind of derm. I need a Chris Ma. Um. I don't. My my quick reference on board cheat sheets don't have a lot of echinoderms in them. All right, Doctor Google. You have not failed me yet. And yes, it produces copious amounts of slime and it will secrete it when touched or just even stressed out by predators. Ooh, now I wonder if we were just sitting there, if it would just like get even more slimy as we watched it. There's a sea, sea cucumber, right? Oh, there's a video of it on YouTube getting uh, poked. So we can't poke the slime star for science here, but on YouTube they did.
Oh, an online person said we all need a Chris Ma. Corley, what were you just saying a moment ago before we got distracted by the slime star? Horror movies, horror. Oh, the orcas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was reading something like online where it was trying to spin it in a positive light of like, oh, they're just really curious how fascinating this behavior is. And I'm like, that is extremely true. But it's still really scary when you're in the sailboat that's now being sunk by orcas. It's also interesting because so I just looked it up again. Um, and for some reason, people seem to think that there was some sort of, like, mother orca or something who had a bad experience with a boat and was the one who taught all of the other orcas how to um, capsize and sink boats. So I'm kind of like, Interesting. How, do you, how do you know that? And why are your, do people keep saying that? Is this like what we wish to believe? Like us making personifying animals and like giving animals a backstory and motivation? When it could be like, eh, it's just for funsies. Well, so I think they're just, they're literally just sinking boats because the orcas aren't like attacking humans or anything. No. There was like a 19, early 80s, late 70s film about a psychopathic orca whale that was like hunting down people and like killing them from the ship and i want to know like was this like a propaganda film like because right around that same time there was all the capturing of the whales and putting them in like sea worlds and various organs or various entities around the world i watched it as a kid and i have not watched it since and i just remember it terrified me as a child And yes, the movie was old when I was a child. Oh, we found the slope. We didn't find the corals. Oh, we found a couple. We've had a couple of those Chrysogorgias and the two big bamboos. But I definitely had hopes of getting here and finding just a wall of life. Okay, so I'm reading the orca thing. So, Alfredo Lopez Fernandez told Live Science that a lead whale, a female orca, scientists have called White Gladys, suffered a, quote, critical moment of agony, likely a collision with a boat or entanglement with a fishing line that turned her more aggressive. And so she is the one who's teaching these pods of orcas how to sink ships. Huh. And it seems like it's just happening in Spain. Yeah. But they are worried that it might start happening. Other pods of orcas might start doing this as well. Interesting. So got a sea cucumber in the top left, a brisingid sea star on the right, and probably a paragorgia in the center. And a little umbalula in the sand. On that note, I think I'm going to WhatsApp my friend that studies whales. Tell me about this. Yep, that's good enough for us, thanks. <laughs> Orcas are like the pandas of the ocean. 
Pandas are vegetarian though, aren't they? Why, yes. They're cute and cuddly, but I would not want to cuddle with an orca. They like playing, they're like cats. They like playing with their food. Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if hitting boats is a game for them. That's the theory I read, read that it's just like curiosity and kind of like a fun game. Orcas have been documented out here. When you find orca anywhere, they're they're pretty much global distribution, but there have been a couple documented cases around these islands. Um, and that's something I've always kind of wanted to see was to see an orca out here in the super clear water. Every time I've ever seen them, it's been in northern latitudes and murky water. It would be really cool if one showed up with the vehicle or even just saw them in the clear um, water from the ship out here in the tropical Pacific or something I've always thought would be really nifty to see. But not the orcas from Spain, right? I'm not really worried about them on a giant steel ship. <laughs> we had a pot of orcas off of Palmyra last year. Yeah, there, there was there was a couple years ago there was a pod documented in the Phoenix Islands of the west here and there was a group of researchers doing shallow water coral reef uh, work and they had the orcas come by while they were in the water and have underwater pictures of the orcas and you know unlimited visibility tropical waters and it was pretty awesome. Wow. I got to work with tagging humpback whales off of Mozambique and so the way it would work was in the morning I would dive down to around 140 feet and we would work on photo identification of manta rays and then after that we would go work on the humpbacks. So while you were diving, they were singing, the males were singing so loudly that like the whole water was just filled with their sounds. And then there was one day, it was so loud that it was, and it was so close, it was like being at a rock concert. Your whole chest would just vibrate. So we were doing our decompression stop and all of us looked at our gauges and we're like, we can go towards the sound. We can swim for another couple of five minutes before we have to surface and get more air. Did you find them? No. Uh -huh. It's so, like, I think there was only one, like, lead master diver down there who had ever seen a, the humpback under the water while he was scuba diving. But it was definitely on my bucket list. I've never seen one diving, um, but I was paddling before sunrise in the total dark in a kayak uh, in Maui a few years ago. and. It was a quiet morning, but it was no moon, and it was really black. And just paddling along, and like hear one blow, like rrr, didn't see it, but just I in the blackness Ooh. near me, just suddenly you heard two blows, and it was cl very close, but I didn't actually see it. And to know that you were, I was that close to something that big in the dark was awe-inspiring, a little frightening. Wow. I've heard him sing once or twice, but never to the point where like it was resonating in my chest. It was truly one of those magical experiences. I always felt kind of bad tagging them because you'd see them and you would kind of chase them down a little bit with the boat and then you would get there and it would be like a two, two males fighting over a female and it made me a little bit nervous or it would be like a, a mama teaching her baby to breathe, like brand new baby. So we we're in the calving grounds. And I like, you got to see some truly inspiring uh, things, but I was like, oh, I feel kind of invasive. Like here's this mother and her brand new calf. And here we are for science. Watching the males fight is insane. Holy Moses. And they could care less that you were there. They could nope. care. They don't care anything about you. They all they have all. is one thing in mind. Yep. Nothing like watching two 40 ton or organisms bash into each other as hard as they yeah. can. <laughs> this looks like another Paragorgia, probably with some zoanthids. These zoanthids here really like the Paragorgias.
What is that? Is that a sponge or something? What uh, is that thing hanging? That hang actually, on? can we? When once we get the shot here, but we can look at uh, the gelatinous organism to the right that could potentially be a predatory tunicate. <gasps> Ooh, to our tunicate fan. Tune in, hurry. Could be wrong, but. We have one person who's like sitting on pins and needles right now. Yep, I think that's looking Ooh. at the, the still image. I think that is a tunicate. Eat your heart out, tunicate lovers. We won't be here too long, but I, that's what I'm interested in. Predatory tunicate, tunicate, predatory tunicate, come on, predatory tunicate. What's the coral again? Uh, that's a paragorgia with zoanthids overgrowing it. Whoa, look at that. It looks like it has little eggs inside of it. So is that the predatory tunicate, or are we uh, still unsure? I am still unsure. What? That's so neat. You can see the little hole on the side, the main hole on the top. Looks like little eggs in there. Yeah, I'm going to go look some stuff up on that one. That doesn't... Doesn't quite fit the fit the model? The mold? I'm pretty sure it's a tunicate of some type, but it's not what I'm used to seeing when I think about it being a predatory tunicate. Wow. But it also has some sponge-like characteristics, too. Unholy baby of a tuna kit and a sponge. Yeah, I'm, yeah. No way possible, but still, in my mind. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's some type of predatory tuna kit, but that's just not the one, the group I'm used to. Or it looks, has at least a different kind of morphology than I'm used to. But I think it's definitely some type of tuna kit. And I don't know if those, if it's gravid, if it's pregnant, I don't know what those dots are. Is gravid just a fancy term for pregnant? Yeah. Okay. That is so um, cool. Could, is it, are we in a spot to collect this? Look at this dude. It looks like he's smiling at us right now. <laughs> like he's saying, hello, you can collect me for science. Learn more about my kind. Tunicate is cool, but where's the this paragorgia is really modeling quite well. <laughs> I mean, like okay. a good time. I feel like yeah. fashion so photographer. Let's not put it like pose, pose. Okay. Let's put it back over here somewhere. <laughs> I was waiting. Like I'm kind of disappointed that you said that. I was hoping it to be like, this is a cool predatory tunicate, but these rocks behind it are <laughs> really the main star of the show. I mean, obviously. Oh, that is a really great shot. And we want to put this in the starboard box. The sample in the forward box is floaty. Yeah, so likely what we're seeing, these darker shapes in here are likely gonads or some kind of reproductive structure. Yes! Um, so cool. Okay, that was a little going to tone down the excitement again. For, for reasons we don't fully understand, 
a lot of these transparent organisms have trouble making their reproductive organs transparent. And so a lot of times what we see when you see these mostly clear things, when they have a dark um, or pigmented body in them, a lot of times that's associated with reproduction. That is so cool. So tunicate fan on the internet, I'm glad we could uh, provide for you. Yeah. I'm not sure if our tunicate person is still on. I see a couple of comments about tunicates, but I don't feel the same love and passion coming off of the screen like I did. Uh, okay. So when you're looking for these things, uh, are you looking at the Telestrator screen right in front of you or the big screen up on top? Either one, either Brian Corley. Oh, me? Sorry. Um, no, no, no. Yeah, no, no, no. I was like, the question. Uh, I bounce back and forth. I guess I kind of, I guess my normal pattern is I'm watching the big screen in the front of the control van for kind of scanning. And then if there's something I see that I can't tell what it is, a lot of times I lean in towards the, the smaller screen in front of me to kind of see if I can get a better view out of, of it. I also watch the big screen and then... The little one, the little yeah, telestrator. Yeah, also the little one. Right now I'm watching the little screen for the still cam. Uh, it's, That's a little, it's slightly different because it's at a different angle, so I'm able to see some other things that you can't see on the big screen. It's because it's like offset or something. The still cam looks so neat. Like it's got really great resolution on it. It does, yeah. the crinoid escapes. I love watching them swim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always forget that crinoids can swim. Okay. But they have to be like very stressed out to swim, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, well, I was about to get collected. So. <laughs> <laughs> Life or death for a crinoid. Great job. Way to go, ROV team. That was awesome. Roger, roger. Okay, now it's still swimming away.
Oh, someone crying away. So we have a viewer online who says, sometimes they think our sample collecting is like thrift store shopping. You see something cool and it has to come home with you, even though you're not exactly sure what it is. As a fan of thrift store shopping, I fully agree. Love, love, love me some thrift store. So you got another pair of Gorgia here, pretty metallic Gorgia. Starting to pick up the corals a little more and more as we come up this ridge. I'm optimistic the top here will be pretty interesting. Get there just about in time for us to get relieved. Couple more bamboo corals. So like this looks more like a sheet flow to me. This is like more representative of that. What is a sheet flow exactly? A sheet, so it's just like a morphological feature of um, a lava flow. Uh -huh. So you can have like the pillow basalt that I told you about before, but it's just a different way that um, it forms. So more in sheets as opposed to pillows. Just looking out the cameras, looking at the world outside the control van. Looks like first light is coming out. It's starting to oh see. Oh yeah. See Maybe some you guys daylight. can see sun. Oh no, they can't see sunrise, but we can see sunrise. Where are y'all looking? There's, that's a new um, group of crinoids for the um, for the dive. This is Proisocrinus. It's a stalked crinoid or sea lily. We were seeing a lot. We've seen a lot of um, crinoid diversity on this expedition so far. I'm actually more interested in what's on the rock behind it, though. Right now, what's that? very beautiful. So brightly colored. So like zoanthids? Probably stolen if we're in Sarah, can you focus on the, uh, yeah, there we go, thanks. <coughs> so we think these are either um, zoanthids or um, colonial anemones. And I have to, lean, the more I'm looking at, the more I'm leaning towards colonial anemones. Oh. All right, I think we are good here, thank you. What is stolonifrin? It's another group of corals. Um, 
I don't, uh, off the top of my head, I don't remember exactly where they fall in the, um, the greater taxonomy. Mm -hmm. They're a type of octocoral, but they don't grow a skeleton the same way the others do. Ah, uh, okay. So on a different ocean note, the Little Mermaid came out last night. Oh, yay. Yay. And I'm reading the reviews online. Okay. I think we can go. Those are some cool rocks. Looks like another bathopathies in there. Just, uh, a couple bamboo skeletons that appear to be dead. Big roll. I think a strong part of me must hate myself because I love, <laughs> like, it makes me feel a little bit nauseous every time I do it, but I do it all the time. It's like when you feel that mid, like that big roll, and you look at the uh, stern of the bow camera and you could see it happening, every time it makes me feel a little nauseous and I do it so <sighs> often. That's a black coral we haven't seen yet, so let's look at that if you don't mind. And yeah, can push in there, Daryl. Y'all have amazing eyesight to see it. Until you started zooming in, I could not see what y'all were talking about. So this is a black coral or That's a good. type of anthropotherian. I'm not sure yet. Past black, what it is. Go out just a bit for us. Thanks. All right, that's good enough for us to get an ID. Thank you. Right. So I was going to say Pranopathies, and Steve is saying either Pranopathies or Heteropathies. So a viewer online says their favorite mythological creature is the Ogopoga mo mythical freshwater monster. So like Loch Ness Monster, except from British Columbia, Canada. That's pretty cool. I 
love all the indigenous myths because they're just so um, so interesting and you wonder about was this really a creature and then right around the time that uh, settlers came in we decimated it or maybe there's some kind of change that happened and the creatures no longer exist I love Native American legends and mythology Looks like we've got a smaller Paragorgia here, one that has not co gotten, been attacked by any zoanthids yet. Push in a bit if you want. Yep, that's good. Definitely Paragorgia. Okay. Push in just past the DSC if you want. Oh, I'll just cut. There we go. Got some good pictures. I'm not a geology person at all, but I'm definitely kind of enjoying the diversity between all these different geological features on this dive. From like sandy with some little pebbles, to the sheet lava, to the big rocks, to, I don't know what this is called now, pillow lava? Maybe? Yeah, yeah. this is kind of pillowy. Yeah. So as we keep going up, I'm like, are there going to be more cool geological? features, keeping it diverse, keeping it interesting. Um, for seamounts, I think the only other thing we would see are those like turbidite. Those striation one where it looks like kind of a layered cake, a tiramisu kind of thing? Yeah. Cool. And that might be when we come back for watch this afternoon. How do those form on shield volcanoes? I think they're um, mostly like, I think it's like mostly carbonate, but it's like. Okay, so that is. So I don't think it's actually, yeah, it's not actually the volcanic rock that's doing it. It's okay. It's softer sediment. Got it. That makes sense to me. I was like, how does volcanic rock make turbidites? <laughs> These little chrysogorgias seem to be the coral of this dive, which they sampled on the last watch. They're really pretty. Yeah. Chrysogorgias as a family are definitely my favorite. Corley, your favorite is Eritophores, right? Eritogorgia, yeah. Eritogorgia. Which is a genus of Chrysogorgia day. Brian, do, or sorry, Chris, do you have a favorite of all the corals? Uh, the deep sea corals, I like. Those are really large white corals that we saw the other day. Oh, those, those are, are my pretty. favorite. I yeah. They're beautiful. Oh, um, just to your right in your starboard camera, there's another big Eritogorgia. Ah, good eye. 
Daryl, do you have a favorite type of coral that we've seen? The bubblegum coral has been my favorite so far. Oh yeah, those are those are pretty cool. Paragorgia. Oh. Oh. Mother. Look at you. Really nice Paragorgia. Pushing a little past the junk on the porch there. Thank you. That's good. So oh, beautiful. Yeah. All right, science is happy. Thank you. Got it. A viewer online says that their favorite folklore is a Maldivian <laughs> shapeshifter sea Touching monster. with the DSC. <laughs> <laughs> it's about as close as you can get. That was a nice one. Yeah. Wait, hopefully I got that one. Let's see. Uh, sorry, oh, I was yeah. trying to dial the Z bias in here. It's not quite right. I should get some good ones, though. All right, there. Okay, coming up. <laughs> Look at the size of that base. That would have been a massive coral. What do you think happened to it? No idea. Can we check out the sponge, please? Or no, oh my god, that's a base too. Yeah, that's what I thought you were talking no, about. No, I was talking about the littler one. <laughs> wow. That would have, I can't imagine how big that coral must have been at some point. Pegasus is another one of our viewers' favorite mythological creatures. It would be really fun to ride a Pegasus. My five-year-old self is like screaming with joy. I don't think we need a very close look at it, but can you get the lasers over it just to get a sense of scale? Yeah, push in a bit now. That's good. This used to be a bamboo coral. It's now home to a bunch of um, hydroids and one squaw lobster and a feather star, a, crino a chromatula crinoid. Thanks. 
This is that Paragorgia we've been seeing a lot of, and then another one of the Chrysogorgias over here on the right that we've seen quite a bit of. Ah, and here's an Anthemastus. That's new for this dive. The little anemone yeah. looking thing? Yep, the little anemone looking thing. Push it on him if you want, yeah. They're commonly kind of their common name is a mushroom coral. That's good enough. We don't, they're right. I thought the mushroom corals were those little dog chew toy looking things. They are when they when when they retract their polyps. There's also a couple, you know, there's several species in different groups, and so they do have some different. Um, differences among them too. That might be Pseudoanthemastus. Several big Aridogorgias here. So we are right at approaching 2,000 meters water depth. We're at 208, 2008 right this moment. I wasn't paying attention, but what depth did we start at the watch? Um, I don't know. I don't remember where we took the- 2400, correct? 2, yeah, we started the dive about 2400. I don't remember where we re-picked up what depth we were when we left the bottom for the cooling issue and came back. So for those at home, we uh, started a dive yesterday, had a cooling issue, and we had to come back up. And that's why we're restarting the dive unsung heroes of this expedition and I'm sure of every expedition the ship's crew like oh I walked by where they were working on the cooling issue and I just it is so hot like it was felt like it was 120 degrees right there so thank you to the ship's crew working on the cooling issue got it fixed and now we're able to dive again Chin just a little. There's another the large, yes. not very healthy bamboo coral. Good. Thanks. It's like another Vitalogorgia here in the bottom right. Probably a white morph Paragorgid up here in the center, or potentially just completely taken over by Zoanthids. Looks like another tunicate there on a stalk, same one we collected earlier. Another anthemastus or pseudoanthemastus there at the just leaving the screen on the bottom. I'm 
actually, are you in a position to take a look at that pink thing that just came off the bottom? That yeah. might have been different. Oops, Sandy. Pushing a bit there, down. That's that's still that's still a paragorgia. Thank you. Okay. For a second there, I thought that might have been Swiftia. Have you found any Swiftia on this expedition? I have not seen one. No. What is Swiftia? Ooh, it's pretty. Those are some angular rocks. These are more flat, so angular. It's more. It's more three D. I don't know how to say that better. <laughs> so what causes these to be more flat, less angular? So two things. One would be kind of like similar to like the turbidite currents, some sort of like mass wasting event that like broke them apart and then they started encrusting or sheet flow. Definitely picking up a higher density of paragorgia here. It's either a B1 or a C1 clade um, bamboo coral on the left, another paragorgia on the right. As we continue to climb this steeper section of this. You're gonna have to turn to your right there, but. Um, this kind of side feature on this big uh, unnamed geo that we're colloquially calling Seamount 123 because it had dive sites 123 on it for the original plan of the cruise. Um, there seems to be a lot of marine snow out here. Yeah. That's uh, pilot induced. Oh, okay. All right. There. And we go back to it. What is this thing? Another metallic orgia here. If you could bring back any dinosaur from way long time ago and just keep it in a zoo, what would you bring back? Hmm. I got uh, minus triceratops. Let me stretch it out just another 10 meters here. Five-year-old me would have had a very detailed answer on that. <laughs> I have replaced most of my good dinosaur taxonomy with deep sea coral taxonomy. <laughs> you could choose a like a deep sea coral from ancient times. I think we're looking at them. <laughs> I'm definitely going with the three horns. Land before time, indelible point of my childhood. I think like, I liked the short squat armored ones like Ankylosaurus and things like that. I always thought were cool. Oh, those were cool. Was that the one with like, um, 
The big ball on the tail? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. At least that's what they called it when I was five. <laughs> Daryl, what's yours? Baryonyx would be pretty cool. If you could like, uh, which one? A Baryonyx. What is that? It's a water dwelling, basically a water dwelling uh, predator. So you mostly fish, or supposedly eat, and stayed more in uh, deep to shallow rivers. It's a predator. Yeah, if you can find a picture of one, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, I can't, how do you spell it? B Y, it's like Barry Onyx, so O N X Y something. So however you spell Onyx, it's a little bit. Nope, I'm getting Brian Jones, the football player. Let me see if I can find it. A lot of these good-sized dead bamboo stalks here. Okay, Lynette, I think we can. I think I would want to bring back T-Rex because I have this theory that it might look like a giant chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so I would want to test the theory. <laughs> but it's like every time I see a chicken, especially some of the chickens um, in Hawaii, the ones that have like, they're like super fluffy, I literally am like, that's a dinosaur. It's a dinosaur. Let's see. Oh, I think this was in like Jurassic World or Jurassic Park 3. The it Baryonyx. Was. Oh, well, kind of that was the Spinosaurus. I think the one you're, oh, it was. There's Spinosaurus and then a Baryonyx was in it. Yes, yes, yes. Here you go, Daryl. Nice. Chris, what about you? If you could bring back any dinosaur and keep it in a zoo. Oh, I like the Brachiosaurus, the really big ones. Oh, with the long necks? Come yeah. down five that meters, please. Cool. I think it'd be really cool to see them. Cue Jurassic Park music. <laughs> yeah. Oh. It was in a Jurassic Park. It was one of the newer Jurassic Park movies. That makes sense. After Jurassic World, like the first one of that trilogy, ooh, no thank you. I you know didn't like those? No, I didn't like Fallen Kingdom or Dominion. Aww. I think I just watched the first Jurassic World and I haven't seen any of the other ones. The first one was pretty good. I did enjoy it. I'm I definitely a uh, Jurassic Park fan. So even Jurassic World is one of my favorites. So, oh, Lynette. Um, are you think if we go all the way to waypoint six, are we going to be able to make the move to waypoint seven, or do we need to cut the corner? Thank you, online viewer, for properly spelling out Baryonyx. Okay. Ooh, so somebody's saying Diplodocus. Oh my gosh, all these names I can't pronounce. Archaeopteryx, Velociraptor, I got. I can do Velociraptor. But I think the issue is that they always made the Velociraptors way too big in the movies. Yeah. They're actually really tiny. I remember, uh, uh, in undergrad in the geology building, they had like a fossil velociraptor. Zoom, sea star. Or oh, replica. Yeah. <laughs> and replica. They're so tiny. They're so tiny. Ooh, a star. <laughs> Is it a mucus Can star? Can you uh, push in on the sea star there? No, I'm not. Push in just a little. Let me get closer. Not the one to ask. I want it to be a mucus star. 
don't believe I don't believe it's a slime star, no. Dang it. It's still a cool star. This one is fully giving Patrick star. Okay, I can zoom in there. I feel like our watch has come full circle now. At the beginning it was like, what's your favorite SpongeBob character? And now we're seeing the SpongeBob characters come to life. Hi, Patrick. I think this, I think this is some kind of Goni Astrid sea star. All right, that's good enough, thanks. Okay, you're going. I'm now Google searching all the dinosaurs that people have been sending in. Oh, this one's cool. Just wish it was easy to spell some of them. Yeah. Oh, you got, this one has a cute little face that you just want to hug. Till it munches on your face. Uh, I think the one that I was just looking at, it looked like a giant Brachiosaurus. Uh, it was a Diplodocus. Oh, whoops. Was it a Diplo? Yes, yes, yes. Reminds me of the game I used to play, Ark Survival Evolved, and that game had a whole bunch of different dinosaurs in it. Cool. Now I'm looking at what they, somebody's favorite was the very first ever bird. Archopteryx. Oh, no. So you got another bamboo coral whip here with uh, Bathypathies now off the screen, but on the top left there. This one's the tip's been damaged, and we've got some hydroid secondary coloniz colonizing the skeleton of the bamboo. And Coralie, somebody else said that they want to see the T-Rex come back to life, because yes, it would look like a big fat chicken. <laughs> oh, this one will give me nightmares for days. Okay, so you think this is scary? But, but you, but you're fine with the ship getting attacked by boobies again. <laughs> like, look at the face on that. That looks like something that will haunt my nightmares with that side eye, the weird little razor sharp teeth. The if boobies look cool. If you want to, if you want a repeat of Jurassic, whatever, take your pick. It's literally <laughs> getting attacked by boobies on the Nautilus. <laughs> <laughs> but the videos, like you showed of them, like looking at their reflections in the glass or so stinking cute they're not oh my gosh <laughs> a bit there, there. <laughs> i will think whatever i want to think until we get attacked by boobies again okay. there is there go. another case Look, yep looks like there is a an egg case or <gasps> remnants of an egg case oh. there so neat so some some deep sea cephalopods and potentially sharks um, like to lay their eggs in the corals. And so that kind of greenish blob on the top right hand side of this paragorgid looks like the attachment point of probably some type of cephalopod egg case. Some colleagues of ours at Woods Hole actually sampled one and had it hatch on the ship um, shortly after they got it on board. Cool. And I think it I've was seen a little Dumbo octopus. Like, was it a type of little Gadumbo with his big old ears of flapping? Yep. So neat. Get a uh, tight shot on the egg case if you want. Maybe. Looks like we also have another tunicate hanging out here. Go uh, full zoom there. Is there still something in there? It looks pretty bulky. It's definitely possible. <gasps> it's the neatest thing of the night. Yep. A possible baby cephalopod. Baby cephalopod. You got it? Yep. Okay, go away.
Sure. Stegosaurus and Mosasaurus. What is a Ramphoro crisis? Oh, like a pterodactyl with razor sharp teeth. I guess something similar to Tronodon. Yeah, all these creatures look like they could haunt my nightmares. But it's just, you have to remember, it's like the way that they're drawing them. Have yeah. you seen, have you seen, so they've like given skeletons of like bears and like whales and stuff to people who do the like similar drawings of extinct uh -huh. animals and they look crazy scary. I do that with my students, like we'll do, we do a lesson on like marine archaeology, or I'm sorry, marine dinosaurs. And so I'll give them like a, a dinosaur and then they have to piece it together and then I'll give them like a bear or a whale or some, like a cat and a dog or some of them too and a chicken. And then I'm like, okay, piece it together. And they put all the bones together how they think they go, and then they have to flesh it out. Horrible. Yeah. But now I want to look it up. Yeah, someone did a really cool analysis. I forget where it was published somewhat recently, though, looking at the lack of fat that, like, the people who render a lot of um, shapes of or or animals based on skeletons just, like, leave the fat off completely. And Ooh. Yeah, you're right. Here it is. So here's a bear drawn as a dinosaur. Ooh. That is awful looking. Looks like another very thin metallic gorgia. Another paragorgia. This is definitely the paragorgia with zoantha dive. As they are definitely the da dominant um, thing we're seeing here. So actually, we're seeing so many of them. Um, Dan, when you're in a happy spot to sample something, let's uh, take a snip of these paragorgias we're seeing everywhere yeah, so we can confirm the ID on them. Right here. <laughs> One of the pink <laughs> ones, pressed up her up, wasn't it? Uh, this one pink? Yeah, it is. Right here. Zoom in there for us, Daryl. Ah. Forgot I turned it off. How we do? You got. Uh, you can come up a bit there if you want. Just nice and slow, eh? Uh, 
How big a piece do you want, right? 10 centimeters, 10 to 15 centimeters. Okay, come up. Roger. Um, where is this going to go? Can Anywhere go in the starboard box, yeah. except any of the small starboard bow boxes. Yeah. Roger. It looks like you're about to give a bouquet of flowers to somebody. I know. Here, Atalanta, this is for you. Oh, you remembered. <laughs> you remembered my birthday. It is our well, anniversary. Uh, How'd you know, honey? Open the starboard box that? first. Ooh. Swimming, <gasps> swimming polychaete. Okay. There it is again. Hi, friend. They're so cool the way they uh, uh just roll Any out. particular box here? Um, any 